And as much as we protest, as much as we riot, you know, these things are still happening. What's up? Oh, you snatching out the glasses right now? <laughs> is this your setup in Portland? Yeah, this is this is my little bachelor pad. This is awesome. First of all, Portland is blowing up right now. Um, to see the people and the passion on the news in Portland, oh, yeah. we, amazing. What's it like being there? Uh, I mean, Portland is an extremely uh, liberal town, so I feel very. It's a very white town, but it's a very liberal town, so I feel. Uh, lucky to be here, you know, outside of um, all the amazing resources it has, like being a chef here is really fantastic because we have all this amazing produce. The chef community is really strong. Uh, but outside of that, you know, politically, you know, mo the majority of the city that I live in, Portland, Oregon, is very much in line with so many important causes that are, you know, just current, you know, necessary, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter from, you know, like, equity, uh, gay rights, you know, trans community, you know, we have all of it and we have tons of people who are passionate about everything. Um, so there's, we've been protesting every single night and, you know, uh, Portland is, is very much aligned with um, the voice of what's going on in America right now. So I feel very lucky to live in this town. Nice. It, you said something interesting. You said equity. Yes. Yes. <laughs> A lot of people have been talking about equality, but why is it important that we have equity? Uh, you know, I think, I think, you know, I think with the reckoning that we're going through now and, you know, the kind of civil rights movement that George Floyd's death started, you know, by being kind of like the tipping point yes. of something that's been going on in America forever, <laughs> you know, and yeah. I think kind of like the post civil rights movement, you know, movement that's slowly been building up up to this point, you know, um, I think it's important that we're able to, you know, at this point, we're pretty much trying to tear everything down. You know, yeah. everything that's been built in the past 40 to 50 years, you know, we're tearing it down because the system hasn't worked. And I will say, yes, there have been uh, leaps of uh, success and achievement and opportunities given to POC, people of color in this country. But at the end of the day, so much has been denied from us. So much has been held back for us. Um, and it's apparently clear. Um, and, you know, the pandemic kind of destroyed everything. And, and we were just at a tipping point, I think, altogether. So here we are, and it's up to decide. It's up to us to decide what's going to come back and what's gonna, what we're leaving behind. It's crazy because you're right. The, the COVID-19 was the tipping point. But it was also, I feel like, the universe's way of being like, you can't run from this anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to react to it and you have to speak up because you're not too busy. You didn't hear about that because it's everywhere. It's on our phones. It's on our TVs. I mean, yeah. uh, this man's face, George Floyd, in every single medium that we had. Yeah, I mean, it was just hard to watch, you know. I mean, I think, I mean, I was following, you know, I, I followed Brianna's death and I uh, murder i followed ahmad's you know murder you know i watched you know that video it's it's awful you know you know i cried like i'm a runner you know my sister yeah. lives in atlanta you know um that could be me you know so so for me to watch that video i think i watched it like late one night and then you know like it was like the amy cooper thing at the same time you know she's like whatever with that you know let's let's talk about george floyd you know because it's you know, someone, another man just died, you know. I mean, unfortunately, like, here we are in this thing and, and people are still dying. You know, we, we lost two trans people, um, per, uh, you know, part of the trans community. The uh, rights are getting taken away. We're getting murdered. You know, a young man was found hanging in California. And, you know, they tried to say it was suicide, you know. Uh, you know, so there's, there's we're still, we're, the, what we're fighting for is still happening as we speak, you know, yeah. and as much as we protest, as much as we riot, you know, these things are still happening, you know, um, people are still getting shot in, you know, Georgia, you know, so it's like, are we not loud enough, you know? Yeah, gotta be louder. It's crazy because your family is from Haiti. Indeed. And at, in Haiti, y'all not only sitting at the table, they <laughs> own the table. 
<laughs> yeah, so. And not just why clap. The audience <laughs> of the table. What was it like growing up in America? Because you grew up right here in New York. I did. I grew up in New York. So I actually grew up quite different than my, my, my parents did. You know, my father grew up with no running water or electricity. So to raise, you know, me, you know, in New York, yeah, you know, like in the, in the 90s, at the height of like rave culture, you know, I just grew up extremely different. They really wanted lots of opportunities for my sister and I. So they worked all the time. They went to school all the time. You know, they put us through private school. They used like scholarships, like whatever government, whatever we could do to put us through like better education, you know, uh, they did, you know, so I was able to go to private school. I went to NYU for a year. I was going to study pre-med, but then uh, I moved out West and I, I studied wildlife biology for a hot minute. And then I wow. started cooking, um, you know, and being out in college in Montana is where I actually started cooking and feeding myself and decided I wanted to be a chef. So, um, you know, my parents, they worked hard and, you know, they have very, very heavy Haitian accents, you know, uh, they were obviously in these neighborhoods, you know, where we grew up was predominantly Haitian American, Caribbean American, Black American, you know, but we were always in these worlds where, you know, they were working at Jewish run hospitals and I would go to these schools and I would be a, a small cluster of, of minority students at these schools. You know, um, they always thought that, you know, you just have to do the right thing. You have to like be prim and proper to get ahead. And I was and like, head down you have to like tuck your shirt in you know you know and i'm like mom well, dad you know like you know like i don't want to conform how i look you know not like in like a, a loss of cultural way but just like prim and proper you know um because our culture was always extremely important to us and and you know we, were, we never hit our culture it was always extremely important to us you know we, we we've had tons of family you know come from haiti you know start going to college here and raise their families here so it was all just really great um but, you know, I, I think just them always being such a positive example for me um, of, of hard work and dedication. And, you know, I think part of the story is there is this element that these, this American dream is very possible because my parents yeah. did it. You know, they came here, they, were, they, they barely spoke English, they learned a language, they put themselves through school, they raised two kids, you know, they, they took advantage of everything they could to afford these opportunities to their kids. And, and it produced me, you know, like I didn't, I did not have a, I have not had a perfect life, you know, like I'm a recovering drug and uh, an alcohol addict, you know, so I've, I've had my falls as well, but I always had the example of my parents put me through these things. What is important is to know that, you know, my story is not everyone else's story. And, you know, my story of hope and possibility, like it's, it's not guaranteed. Because you can have far more than I ever did, my family ever did. You can have far less than my family yeah. ever did. And you could try to be getting the same thing. You could just be like a good person, a good black person trying to do the right thing and go to school, and you can end up shot and dead. So, you know, that's when we talk about equality, we're talking about having the same opportunities for everyone across every city, across every uh, economic background, um, and, and, and us just working together so that can exist in America. It's so crazy because watching Top Chef this this season, but also looking at Twitter and seeing like there's all these hashtags about supporting black owned restaurants and, and Postmates came through and, and kind of deleted all the delivery fees, you know, people who are supporting black owned businesses. How do you feel, you know, being someone who's about to open a restaurant mm -hmm. and does it feel more invigorating right now that people are starting to put, you know, a spotlight on black owned businesses? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really fantastic. You know, I, I think at the same time, it is a bit reactionary, you know, because it is a reaction to something that's just really awful that's happening. And this is how we're dealing with it now. But I think at the end of the day, if we're able to walk away from this with a spotlight on all these places that we've never heard of, and we can continue to support them, this is not a fad. This is, you know, yeah. we're, we're reading these books and these books become part of our library. We're going to these restaurants, you know, after they reopen and, you know, all the other fine dining restaurants are open as well, but we're still continuing to support these businesses. Um, you know, I think if we're continuing to be aware of these resources, these black and these POC resources, um, it's not a fad. And, and as soon as the next thing happens, we like, we shift focus, you know, then I think it all makes sense, you know, um, but, you know, it's definitely something reactionary, but we definitely appreciate the platform. 
Um, we need to recognize the contributions of black and POC to this country um, in the finer details of everyday living. And, you know, that, that presence is 100% there. No, 100%. And I always tell people, because, you know, we talked about The Bachelor having their first, you know, black bachelor. And you know, people get really upset about it. I'm like, don't be upset about it. We wanted a reaction. We wanted change. It's baby babies. Yeah. But you tell people in your industry, you say, yes, this is great. But what are you going to do for the rest of the year, for the next five years, for the next yeah. year, to make sure that change really happens? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you know, I'm, I'm nosy <laughs> and like I know a little bit behind the scenes. So I'm like, okay, who has been working on this for a few months and who has been doing this just now? So like, I know like passing for The Bachelor, like maybe like kind of like took place a while ago. So like, I would say that that's probably legit. <laughs> He's like, no, he knows. <laughs> you know, you know, I host a pop culture talk yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear about everything. Yeah. I'm going to shade ABC right now, but yeah. I'm just <laughs> this man was supposed to be on this season of The Bachelorette. Uh -huh. So they did vet him. He was going to be a part of the 25 men. And they plucked him from there and just made him The Bachelor because uh -huh. okay. See? Bachelor Reac is whoever gets to the top three or top four yeah. running to become the next person in line. Mm -hmm. to, you know, to get the, to give it to hand out the roses. So yeah, it was reactionary for sure. But I'm lucky in my lifetime that we have Rachel Lindsay, who is holding down the fort, who was the first black bachelorette. She ain't going nowhere. And mm -hmm. she is questioning every single thing that they are doing. Yeah, yeah. Bravo in, in the restaurant business, you are going to question every single thing because you and I are nosy. Yeah, yeah. And I think it just takes people, even if you're at a small job, if you're not a celebrity, if you are a celebrity, it doesn't hurt to ask your employers or your HR, like, how are we doing this to make this happen for generations on? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. I mean, I, I call it active inclusion. You know, people are like, well, how do I do this without, you know, like, posting an ad, like, hey, I need to hire a woman or, hey, I need to hire a POC, you know? And, you know, my friend said it best, Nina Compton, she's a chef, she's on Top Chef as well. She's like, listen, if you're a chef and you want the best vegetable, or like the bestest from across the country, across the world, you're gonna go out and find it. So, you know, I think we just have to be honest and, and you know, be actively inclusive. I think the, the best part coming out of this is, is yes, we are seeking someone, yeah. but, you know, make sure that person is the best fit and, and make sure it's, it's, it's something that you're willing to invest in and, and make sure that, you know, you believe in this person. You know, you're not just checking a box to check a box, but you're actually, you know, choosing the right person for the job and that person happens to be black or poc you know so when you're looking for a taste tester at con <laughs> I, i'm gay i am jewish i'm from the south I <laughs> Trina. we can check off 10 boxes I'm eat. are you friends with michael twitty wait no but let me tell you something dorothy who's a friend of mine who was also on eon rich kids of beverly hills she's <laughs> in this Okay. She's in the chat right now, and she and I are foodies, and we will go <laughs> everywhere. To eat. But like we, if it's good, we're in. We're coming. What would you say to young people of color who are coming up in the restaurant industry? Because when you do look at the restaurant landscape, it's not that colorful. No, it's true. So I think a if you look at fine dining, it is a very male white kind of establishment you know there's lots of european influences in fine dining you know i did it i worked for a french chef i worked for jean georges for six and a half years you know? yeah he was you know he actually afforded me a lot of opportunities you know he you know my man my mentor was his right his man is still his right his his right hand person uh, and, um, you know, I was a, a chef de cuisine friend by 26. You know, I, I, I did my intern with him straight out of, in culinary school. I worked for him straight out of school and I advanced at a, I feel like a very a proper rate. Um, you know, within like five years, I was a chef de cuisine friend. Um, you know, I think when you think about it, you know, honestly, one third of all restaurants in America is run by a, a person of color. You know, uh, yeah. half of all restaurants in America are owned or run by women. 
you know so when you think about what the american restaurant looks like it's far broader than the images that we see in fine dining yes um and maybe some of the things that we might see in publications but you know i think even these publications these food magazines that are that are coming down right now you know they've made all these types of different cultures of food they've made them food trends you know and if they've all been exposed because there are these white run companies who don't treat their employees fairly but every new culture that comes out it's like the hottest trend yes. you know and they put these chefs on these platforms you know from like from you know from african food to you know you know to the new wave of southern black chefs you know um to filipino food you know like they make these things trends when in actuality it's not a trend and where it's from yeah you know, like, like southern food even modern southern food is not a trend to black chefs in the south no you know? or even you know eduardo jordan who lives in seattle you know like to the filipino chefs it's not a trend you know it's not something that's like good for a year two years it's like what they grew up eating it's what we grew up eating you know so uh i just encourage the young chef now's a very challenging time because restaurants are closed and we have a very <clears throat> uphill pill to reopen restaurants. But I say, like, if you do not have to look hard to find a chef that looks like you, you know, and maybe 100%. he's not on TV, um, but he might be on TV now and he might be in the magazine now because right now is the time to, to be aware. But if, if we're looking, truly looking at what the American restaurant is, they are filled with people of color um, because at the end of the day, you know, the people who found the men, the white men who found this country, we were the people that cooked for them. So, you know, and we, we, are, we are still the foundation of restaurant and eating in this country because restaurants and dining in America um, were, were made with our, with our work. Um, so, you know, if you're a young chef, find someone that looks like you. It is not that hard. You know no one can smother like us. <laughs> so like us. You know we get all up in there. <laughs> when, when is Khan opening as of now? Uh, uh, so uh, I was trying to open in January, but uh, so this year, <laughs> but, but I'm taking some time. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna let Miss Rona do her thing and uh, just uh, you know just I just want to see what American dining looks like. You know I don't want to open. You know to me this is like a very very important restaurant. It's my dream restaurant. You know I was I was at my last job for for, for ten whole years. You know um, so this is like my first step doing my own thing. Uh, and I just want to do it right. It's a very personal restaurant. You know, it's, it's just all my upbringings, like all my Haitian heritage, like everything I've learned over the years. So this is a very personal project. So for me, I want to do it just right. And it's more important that I open right than I, than I open as soon as possible. So hopefully summer 21 um, is, is, is when I'm shooting for. And um, hopefully that we, we can get back either with a vaccine or, you know, Corona just kind of lives with us and, and we figure it out. But um, next next summer, hopefully. 100%. Everybody out there, since Khan is not going to be open until summer 2021, <laughs> I guess that you find the dopest Haitian spot <laughs> in your city. Because I'm telling you right now, when I lived in New York, my ass used to go to 107th Street because one Haitian joint at the top, it looked like a... <laughs> it all, but the line out of this place was unbelievable. You yeah. can't eat Asian food, it's just its own thing. <laughs>